Ross Lovegrove. <laughs> All right, guys, you can go. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Panel, course masters, tutors, founder of the DRL and the director, Aldo from Colombia, Alfredo from Spain, Andrew from America and myself, Ed from Australia. Today we'll uh, present the findings of, and an architectural proposition gathered within the, within the DRL over the last 12 months. Our thesis in which we have been pursuing over the last year is as follows and consists of an interest in experimenting in implementing housing above the London Railway network, specifically how it can be integrated into the surrounding urban fabric, facilitate communities with a wide range of public program and civic amenity for not only the residents on the interior, however the communities which surround these existing infrastructural scars. <clears throat> Hybridising socially aware architecture with rapidly deployable, high volume and adaptive fabri fabrication systems was the priority of the team's research. The industrial revolution saw a birth of the rail through, throughout the UK to serve and deliver materials around the country. This brought with it a growth and an intricate rail network that has recently now densely been built around. Oh shit. The densifying of it around this rail network has led to divisions in communities, yet now offers new opportunities and territories to reconnect and restitch the urban fabric back together. The decentralisation of the UK made London shift from an economy based on uh, the industry to an economy based on services. Uh, industries nowadays are gone, but the scars are left, as we can see in this video. We can use this opportunity to use this space to transform this infrastructure to a social uh, catalyst. Greater London includes numerous, numerous underground and overground railway lines over 1,000 kilometers in length. This system includes 270 stations and a total of uh, more than 1,000 kilometers uncovered. This is a non-use land, an opportunity for new housing and new dwellings. This is some research from a consulting firm, WSP, that showed sort of the, the possibilities within central London to build that was the previous map. Um, so the four key principles of our project, what we're calling a re-railroadification of London, of London's overground rail system, will provide the city with much needed new dense communities, take advantage of these prolific site opportunities. And this novel site will also provide us with a me method of fabrication, delivery, and construction. Due to the need to maintain the functionality of the ex existing rail network, th this deployment and fabrication must be primarily modular to allow for high volume and rapid deployment. Um, in order to not sort of repeat the faults of previous housing booms, post-war Europe, for an example, requires a new method, which we're proposing a system giving user flexibility and choice rather than standardized homogenous mass constructions. Um, building on such novel sites is above a railroad, while navigating the complexities of people's evolving social needs at such a large scale requires a new tool approach. We're provo proposing using a social configurator to negotiate uh, these micro discussions between different inhabitants, stakeholders, and different viewpoints. <coughs> the social configurator uh, is a platform that allows the user pick from different locations around London and virtually build communities with the participation of other users. These locations are going to, de to be defined. The range of prices and the communal areas are at the core of the community and are triggers that allow the community to get built once the users negotiate and agree upon them. Uh, using the four types of living capsules and the rules of connection, there is a wide variety of possible dwellings to be generated. The units are structural elements, but they're not programmatic units, which means that there is no, no direct relation between units and people. 
After the site selection, the users have option to select the type of unit according to budget, the number of tenants, and any other necessity in each case. <laughs> Stitch breaks the direct relation capsule person generating a diverse social fabric through its spatial configuration, allowing the user to configure their home. On the left side of the screen, we have some relevant data for the user. Below the map of London, where the chosen location appears, there is a dynamic pie chart that shows the area of the simulation so far. Below are the structural data, which show the number of units supported and cantilevered units. Of course, the cantilevered units will have a higher cost. Finally, we have data associated with people, population, the number of communities, which are composed of groups between five and 10 people, and in the end, the density indicator. The configurator details the different areas reporting back to the user the necessary circulation to access, to access the pods. The unit positioning turn finishes and the configurator changes to the second stage in which users will select the social spaces of the community. Uses, users pick from up a library of possibilities that need the support uh, and contribution of a minimum number of people in the community, the backers. Not agreeing in something penalizes the simulation by losing the possibility of building social spaces in that spot. That community agreed on building a kitchen and a media room while failed to agree on a dining area. The positioning of the kitchen and media room will determine the, contribu the contribution as depending on the need of structure and so on. Once it's decided, and if at least one social space was agreed, the community gets built. If anyone does not agree with the final output, the community can reset the simulation. In the end, the circulation is going to be generated procedurally. If there is no possible connection with the floor below and up, the round should reset as well. Users plan ahead of the placement of their customized units using the configurator. The framework provided ensure its fabrication and structural stability. When the user extends his unit, he is intrinsically extending the communal space as well because the unit roof is used as a new public stratum. Architecture through its spatial configuration must encourage social collisions to increase interaction. Geometry and gravity provoke encounters in spaces suitable for social collision. Stitch breaks the relation given in the post-war period in which housing had an homogeneous spatial configuration based on efficiency. Stitch generates fertile spaces for social interaction. In opposition to a corridor-dependent architecture, the spatial configuration of the project generates fertile spaces for interaction. Uh, the geometrical primitive that was used allows creating more faces for social contact, visual porosity, and visual connections. Interaction is understood not only as an act of, that implies physical proximity, but an action that can take place with the use as sight and hearing. And uh, a side note <laughs> is that we're sort of taking what is classically defined as the physical elements on, of a house, the modern living on the left, and are redefining this to what we're calling sort of this collective housing, where sleeping and bathing is the only thing that's privatized and everything else is more public space at various scales. Three different unit conditions were explored for different user groups, <coughs> which were developed not only for the inhabitant, but circulation and aggregation possibilities when different unit modules are mixed together. These design decisions of the unit took into account the social parameters gained through tiered living, <coughs> deploy, deployability and constructability, and the ability to produce communities at high volume. The strip panelling logic came from understanding how several units could be combined and adjoined for different uses and different users, and how strips could be modified or removed to refit and reconfigure modules completely. The system across all unit types consists of three parts. One, a middle shell, both capable of to be solid and enclosed, and two, both transparent, transparent or solid end caps. All units feature drop-in utility and wet areas modules to contain servicing and organise the interiors to make the most out of a small space. The system of the unit 
was to be kept as simple as possible. However, keeping user choice was an op keeping users choice was an option and an opportunity for players and residents to configure their dwellings as they need. Flat unit modules are also offered as, as an alternative to contain different program and cater for a range of different users. The shell system was also designed to be reconfigured to again allow for unit to unit connections and user choice. The slope unit system also takes on a three part system, however introduces tiered living to allow for more covered storage and a physical division between more public and private spaces within an interior without the dependency on interior walling within units. Again, the slope unit um, is reconfigurable and also offers options for uh, users. At an interior level, different tier conditions offer different styles of living, organise interiors and make the most out of small spaces. The division of the unit in strips allows unit to unit relations to be ordered and consistent and continuous between units. This was also envisaged at a bigger scale to make double, triple and quad unit aggregations for different users and different uses. Interiors were also were envisioned to be connected in the vertical direction to cater for various living conditions. Tier living solutions, stow away storage and free the cluttering as well uh, in, on internal conditions and wall conditions. Um, the architectural response we looked at was on uh, sort of three different three different sites: raised, um, sunken, and level, which each sort of have their own um, like parameters and uh, intricacies and nuances, being overground stations or roads passing underneath the raised site. The sunken site is much more intimate with the street level. And actually, and the roads actually pass over the site in this scenario, and it's also incredibly uh, urban compared to, for example, the flat site. This is right next to uh, Houston, and also uh, around 23% of the London rail network is raised, 4% is sunken, and 37% is level. Uh, the examination of train tracks reveals uh, natural parametric tendencies such as varying width counts, which in even central London range from one to more than 20, uh, 20 rails wide at stations such as Euston or King's Cross. And this parametric system is further seen through the evaluation of normals and tangents as the rail twists through, through the city. Um, so how can we provide a framework for living above an existing infrastructure? with minimal structural opportunities that the site allows while simultaneously not disrupting the active rail network below. We developed a trust-like system that branches and reaches down at opportunities, providing an occupiable structure for the public to inhabit and also a playing field for the generation of communities above. This is a typical rail condition, one that you can find, for example, in Bermondsey or Hammersmith. It varies, but is around 18 meters wide and eight meters high, with these rhythmic arches puncturing the plinth. Most of them are filled in and occupied with various uses like small workspaces or storage. Uh, the system is the ability, this truss system has the ability to span these various widths, expanding our playing field above with it. At a small scale, it is a minimal footpath providing continuity m along the rail, and at the largest, it is a massive new artificial territory. And this uh, shows sort of the adjustment to the normal curvatures at, uh, at varying curved conditions of the rail and as the system morphs, uh, destandardizing the structure. Um, this this shows a ray, sort of a classically raised site, showing the this is the the structure, the truss structure elevated above, with a public plane that has uh, tendencies embedded in it, and then units on the playing field above on top of the uh, the structural truss. Uh, and in section, the new public realm is lifted above the rails, acting as an acoustic and reverberation barrier versus the, uh, versus the noise generated from the trains below. 
Uh, the arch column supporting the structure negotiate the openings below, in this case, an opening, an open raised site with tendencies below. In the middle, the continuous public plane travels the length of the rail and holding tendencies in outdoor, indoor spaces and the new housing sits above. This is more of a flat site condition, which you might see at, at Hounslow, and this is primarily similar to a raised site condition. Um, yeah. Here, once again, we see the truss structure, a public plane woven in between, and smaller, more local living as this is gen generally farther away from central London. Uh, and the most urban of all of these uh, contexts is the sunken site, which nestles into the city, for example, in Farringdon. Its structure braces itself against the side of the embankments, allowing for public space to rest at street level or submerge itself into the ground. Uh, this typology elevates itself over street level intersections due to the limited space below and, gr and grapples like its uh, context. As you can see, it's passing over a road and sort of wrapping into the plazas. And this is how it's bracing into the interior structure in section, and here's a longitudinal section showing the varied sectional qualities and new tendencies in close proximity to a fully working transport system. Uh, the, clear, the clarity of the relation between the units, the structure, and the public plane is seen in the circulation, which uh, this public plane in black reacts to the structural system weaving a public realm uh, offered elevated and submerged spaces for the existing residents and new residents. And the connection of the circulation and public realm bridges a gap between the public realm and privatized community above. Right. <clears throat> Throughout the design process, uh, we've been frequently asking ourselves, uh, how can we make this project look more feasible or, or how, how could it become more realistic? Uh, we found the answer in understanding two different, two different uh, features of the project. Uh, first, the management of our design and the management of its uh, construction. Up to this point, my college have described um, the design aspect, uh, space, dimension, elements, and also uh, social configurations uh, that drives the design. Uh, these design aspects have been shaped by the static characteristics of the rail, but we cannot forget that the rail has dynamic characteristics as well. Um, these will are totally defined by a train system that will not be disrupted by our by us building over it. Um, that was one of the main things that we tried to achieve. Uh, the train tracks are both uh, a determining and conditioning factor. Uh, for two opportunities in our, in our construction management. Integrated off-site fabrication was one. And, and the second one was limited deployment. That's why we proposed to build um, using a factory inside of the rail. Um, the factory is totally, uh, is, is, auto, uh, is robotized, so it is the totally automatic process from the configurator um, where the manufacturing occurs during the day because the trucks are, are being used and the deployment occurs during the night, which is when the trucks are more free. So during the day at six o'clock in the morning, um, starts the fabrication process. The whole factory has a, a stock system so you can just store the material on it get restock. The robot then can't cut the foam for the insulation as well. We're a bit bent in the over it. Then the assembly is, is, is done and offside as well. So the unit is arranged using the customized output of the configurator into the units all these constructive units, because let's just remember that the units are not one unit to one person, they can be rearranged in different settings. The structure is, is sectioned um, and divided into sections that fit in the train as well. So all the sections and all the sizes of the elements of the, cons of the structure fits and can be deri uh, delivered on site by using the rails as well. Um, at night, at 12 o'clock, the train can just go in the factory and do the pickup process as well. So I collect the finishes, uh, the finished product, um, 
um, get it ready for deployment on site. So you can just collect, we can see how we're collecting the construction structure bits, and then the units that are arranged in a stock outside as well. And then can, the train can just simply collect the, the units and, and the part to, to deploy on site during the night. This, we've had this, this range of six hours in which we can just um, build. So we've been doing our numbers as well. Um, in, in the settings, we can just deploy I, one constructive unit per hour. So we have six hours every night. That makes us being able to deploy 240 units in, in less than four months. Once we get on, on site, the crane mounted on the train is able to pick these pieces that fit like 2.4 meters, as we said before, and they can be deployed um, and assembled on site straight away, not losing any time, not disrupting service neither. The structure is totally designed for the crane to being able to build it over the train, which makes totally site specific. And then the public planes can be built afterwards once you put the units. Because as we can see in this video as well, the units are deployed once the structure is in place. Same process, as we said before, the crane uh, just takes everything on factory during the day and, and deploys overnight. You can just flip and use both sides of the structure, even if this one is completely built in both sides of it. So the design allows for that as well. You can build these clusters using like the rail as a track, as a, as a robotic arm would do if we are in a, in a factory, but big scale. And then the public plane will show and we'll connect everything together, stitching both sides of the street with the new built community. Much of the above results and research was accumulated and pra practiced with the tools at Autodesk Build Space in Boston in July last year. The, last year, Rapid deployment, speed of design of construction was realized through understanding how the interior of the home could be rethought and real, uh, uh, it's catered for a large range of users within a small footprint. Hyperwall was a one-to-one -one living wall which was consisted of a day bed, desk and storage unit and comprised through a horizontal means of fabrication, which was with the facilities of the space at Autodesk. Robotic hot wire cutting was a subtractive tool utilised to understand the translation of formation form from the digital world through six axes robotic tools to material and scaled outcomes. The time at Autodesk made the team realise the speed at which design could be produced, which paired with current housing conditions in the UK alongside deployable yet new ter territories above rail with a social agenda could be deployed using participatory means and platforms could see a new future in mass housing. Thank you. Side negative side. I'll be So I've, I'll be told to be positive from now on, but. <laughs> so, you, so you've got to be negative, Tom. You've got to be negative. Um, no, I think a really nice project, really well thought out. Um, I think you know, a, a real clear challenge in, 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 in London and, and, and globally. And, um, two, two questions. One is. Did you consider the both economic and environmental costs of building large span concrete structures above a railway line versus just kind of densifying existing kind of plots of land? If you, if you consider that at all, because obviously you know, it's a very good use of existing land, but you're building this big concrete structure which has a cost economically and, and kind of from a carbon point of view. Did you consider that, that at all versus just taking a brownfield site and just building something more conventional? Than a few. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, absolutely. I think the the idea of building above rail for us was really to put less strain, obviously, on the green belt in London and understand how new territories can actually be realised from inf infrastructure areas. Yes, there's a lot of infrastructure that is needed for some of these really tricky sites, hence it hasn't been done yet. However, I mean, WSP have looked into different things like this in a very conventional manner. However, we were sort of trying to understand how a system could do all three, raised, sunken and flat. Obviously, the sunken site being the, the least amount of infrastructure needed, yes, but we wanted to really understand the novelty of what these sites could be. I mean, we're looking at producing a new sort of high street here, how new territories like this can be a completely new sort of different platform of life. So, yes and, and no, to be honest, yeah. That's what I thought. Sorry, Michael. Triggered, sorry. So, uh, I also find this project uh, very convincing, especially I, I love your animation of the future factory of the production. It's it's amazing and it, it's very convincing. It's like Odicon in Denmark, which you probably know. And we walk through the factory, we all understand this is possible. There's a certain naivety to it also. Working with concrete, which is something I do on a daily basis, there is a little bit of a miscalculation in your numbers of construction, I think, but that's aside. But one one thing which I think is a fundamental critique maybe to the overall brief um, is a bit this plug-in system. So you start very well by saying we don't want to do the same mistake as has been done in the post-war period with plug-in houses. But then you suggest this stacking of a system with some kind of, I don't know exactly how, changing of infrastructural ways when things change over time. And that's something where I don't really understand anymore how this approach, so you have how we produce things and how we manufacture, it's all very clear. But what are we doing when it's not being used? What are we gonna do when it's gonna be reconfigured? Where are these stored? How are they mobilized around? And that's when I think there's a, maybe a small missed opportunity in your, let's say, very beautiful infrastructural system that you placed above the railway. How could we use this in a different way to make it easier to actually reconfigure the system? That maybe be something to think about instead of stacking, because how do I get out the bottom one when things change? Very pragmatic, but very important. So, thank you. <laughs> I, would, I, would just, I, would, I would just follow that with a very similar, similar comment. I think uh, overall the presentation was very well put together, so I congratulate you guys did a very nice uh, holistic project in which we can kind of think about the point A to point B to point C to the end of the project. But to me, I also still see this as, a, as quite a linear construction process, and you speak a lot about uh, reconfigurability with these generic units. Um, it's still a huge question to me, who is the owner of this building? Uh, so what is the ownership model? You, you kind of suggest that there's this game being played, but it's still not clear how those constraints are being negotiated other than the fact that if everyone doesn't agree at once, we, we replay again, which I would argue would probably happen over and over again until we stop playing the game and it never happens. So I would really like to understand a bit more if you've thought through the whole reconfigurable aspect of this. So again, yet yeah, logistics of stacking is one, but also the logistics of ownership and decision making. Um, when a person moves out, is there a kind of economic model that makes sense for replacing them in that space? Otherwise, you know, it's very generic. It's like kind of stacking a series of containers. Um, so I would see the benefit of that to be the reconfiguration and efficient use of space and the consideration that this is more of a continuous life cycle as opposed to a linear construction cycle, which is how it's kind of portrayed. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the question of who builds this and who takes initiatives and who curates that platform is, is crucial, right? If you want to do projects like this, because it's an enormous logistical operation. Your factory looks like a centralized, like vertically integrated Katera-like factory, right? It's a huge factory. It's connected to rail lines. It implies that there is a kind of a big organization um, needed to to govern this organization. And um, that kind of like, like the opposite of this would be like self-built, right? You would have a community of people. They would make decisions together. They would use a small factory. They would use probably the same tools as you have, but in a kind of a different setting. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this as a critique, but it's, but it's interesting to consider that what you have devised is actually a kind of, um, 
kind of futuristic version of a Soviet house builder. Like they were using train tracks to ship concrete panels from factories. They were building also with gantry cranes that were almost 3D printing this large, um, this large kind of standardized dwellings, right? So it's, it's in a way, it's very strange to kind of see that, um, that this kind of old Soviet Union technology of vertical integration and using trains is kind of coming back. And like obviously in a, in a project with different aspirations of, of um, being able to offer something unique to the inhabitants and offering something that is adaptable, etc. Um, so I would kind of question a bit like yeah, the platform and does it need to be so vertically integrated? Like are there other ways that we can think about that these tools could maybe be more distributed and that they could be kind of more directly in touch with the people who maybe inhabit these structures? And then on, on another level, and that's more kind of an architectural question, like that, that there's obviously there's a very stark, like I'm looking at this kind of section there, there's a very stark difference, almost a dialectic between the curvilinear bridge that you're building and then the units on top. And I don't say that very often, but I think the curvilinear part is more successful than the orthogonal part in, the, in this particular case. And that makes me kind of wonder, like, wouldn't it be so much nicer to live in that curvilinear part? I mean, that would be like a kind of a loft-like space, a kind of a free plan where with very light materials you could customize dividing walls, right? Rather than having to put a whole kind of level of you know, a kind of a habitat, much this stuff, this habitat on top of that thing. So that would be a bit my question, like, did you consider that maybe rather than using two workflows that you could kind of, just with this curvilinear foam cutting part that you could maybe create to kind of use that also as an inhabitable space and then also have the opportunity because I think if we devise new housing platforms, we need to question more radically what is public and private. And you're, you're almost formally articulating what is public and private, right? You're saying like, this is the public part, and that's the private part. The private part is a cell, the public part is a continuity. And that's, that's kind of, you know, there's a tension there, right? And I, I, I would kind of like to see, if, could we speculate that maybe the public part, may, maybe the private part could be in these more continuous spaces, and does our private life need to be take place in cells, right? <laughs> well, also pick up the conversation from a designer's perspective. But first, I have to congratulate as well in terms of the overall. Um, it's a stunning presentation and I thought uh, you'd gone over the top by designing actually the factory and showing us the different rooms and the way these places, are, uh, sp machines are located and interim uh, storage. I mean, maybe you've gone overboard. <laughs> Just a um, that was quite charming, but um, fully rendered. But in terms of a design, I think it's very strong in terms of design execution, the, the structure. I quite like it, and I like the componentry. I can imagine it being prefab concrete, although there's energy issues there, but, and I like the way you're showing the way this system uh, modulates itself across the different conditions of level and, and bifurcation and so on. I think that's very successful. And I do like the unit to some extent. Uh, I like this, the function of the oblique you took on the Claude Perron thing, and it's, that's quite nice. It's quite compact and convincing for me. It gives a certain complexity to a small space, which, which, which makes it more rich. So I like that, but, but I really you're losing me in the overall image. Isn't there some kind of aesthetic, intuitive control of what you're doing? Because if it kind of piles in like that, uh, it becomes kind of nearly menacing and you lose trust in the system. I mean, there's a sense where you're an intuitive grasp. Beauty is in a kind of signaling of performance somehow. And this delivers doubts. And one of the themes I would uh, immediately question is that you, that, you, that you run these two piles into a peak. Why are they all oriented? Uh, in the same slope, for instance, and then there's variations. But, it, it, but also the orientation with, with the tracks, is it exactly with the tracks, is it a little bit with the tracks. So there's a lot of kind of uh, unresolved. You don't know if, the, uh, uh, if, if something is a mistake or is it is, is, is a subtle move you're making. There, you, there's really um, um, something, a shortfall. You just have to, you know, that touch of beauty, that convincing elegance, which I think the structure has and which, uh, which the, the, the subcluster of this might have. And I think the, uh, the sloping is, is a strong idea. It's a very strong idea. But I also feel like um, whether this idea, that dichotomy between the two systems, 
I would also want to have that address because at least one is receiving the other. How is that happening? Can you actually pile 12 layers? Or is there an additional hierarchy of structure weaving these two? I understand and the container housing at the moment is just piling it and you and that that, 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 that skeletal infill model is maybe too expensive, but still you could have made this um, a design problem. So what you haven't posited to yourself is a static formal problems, problems of formal resolution, the designerly work. You haven't touched that because no maybe not awareness of that in your in your in your in your project. One of the things as I'm looking at this image right in front of me in section, as I'm reminded of what it was like to inhabit the ANA building at Yale, the Paul Rudolph building, where um, the the richness in that building is actually that it's 35 different levels that students know about and that no outside visitor could possibly know about. So as I've, I inhabited that building before it was remodeled and it was freezing and overheated and fucking miserable, but, um, but really a wonderful, wonderful thing to inhabit. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about is the history of collective housing. And one of the reasons that a lot of collective housing um, was created in, for instance, the United States or the UK in the late 19th and early, early 20th century was for labor saving, um, particularly for women. So looking at ways to do the washing, to do the childcare, to do different things kind of collectively. And one thing that you could consider doing in the next iteration in which you resolve these different questions and, and comments is how this notion of, um, of looking at the collective spaces could actually take that into account. Could you free up people's labor in different ways? Could you create different kinds of living or, or social arrangements that support different ways for people to live and work? We're working. To me, it's, it's kind of interesting that I, I see two projects here, actually, and not only because, in ter, uh, because they have um, stylistically different architectural language, but because I think that you are forcing the way in which they kind of correlate at the moment. So I really love the project on the infrastructure. I think it's a really persuasive kind of way in which we can reimagine urban factory as a beautiful landscape that is allowing us to rethink those. It's not a question of available land for a second. I think when you suggested that there is all this land available, I completely agree with the first comment. I mean, there is a cheaper and much easier way to um, start creating the kind of environments you are creating without going into all this expense. So, but, but it is a question of kind of reinventing those existing infrastructural uh, armatures. Now, all this expense, all this effort uh, to then build those serialized kind of semi-vernacular villages on top of it. So from the way I describe it, you can see that I'm less uh, um, into the, the kind of the proposed uh, collective living on top of it. I think there is a disproportion there, S especially in terms of viability. I mean, this structure can take so much more, and I don't think you're actually making full advantage. And, and obviously, in terms of viability, we that's not where we would stop. If you were to achieve what you've achieved with this kind of layering of the infrastructure and this absolutely phenomenal section you are creating, why would we go back to the kind of maybe new take on habitats and start building the kind of serialized stuff on top? Especially, you know, you're, you're suggesting that um, off-site manufacturing or the kind of new methods of construction implies a realization that creates that sort of language. You can build things that don't appear as serialized, that are much grander and structurally will be uh, corresponding better with the kind of amount of structure that goes into your layering sectionally. Yeah, so, so I think there was kind of the, uh, the missed opportunity here was to actually see how much you achieved by suggesting that that section has something to offer to the urban area or to, the, to cities in general. And, and I would encourage you to look better at what is that upper layer, whether it could achieve more and whether we could create more, better correspondence in terms of viability between the two structures. Um, 
Generally, I think you have done a great job and I love the way you presented it. You went from the city's um, scale all the way to the, this internal landscape of how the privacy versus the more common facilities. Uh, you have shown us how you intend to develop this and deploy this system over the railway. So as an overall project, I think you have uh, completed and you have achieved a lot. I have a question or maybe something that is not Clear, tr completely clear to me, and it goes with uh, the initial um, take on connectivity. Uh, this structure over the existing railway doesn't show any way to reach the last apartment, and moreover, is uh, this is only a technical part of it. Maybe you can have a, you have an answer for that, but it's more to do with the fact that uh, you are creating a floating. Uh, community that looks very much detached from from anything else apart from something that doesn't belong to it, that is the railway system. So on one end, I, I really think you had a very strong idea and you really develop it in a very strong way. On the other, I feel this idea of connectivity to the urban fabric and the connectivity of the humans versus the other little humans that I see in this model is for me completely missing. I don't know if you have anything that you can explain us a little bit better on that. How do I reach the top part? <laughs> Some accesses that we presented, that we presented uh, with some images. Like, of course, we have accesses from the side. So, if, 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 I think if, for me, I think following up on on that, I think the public realm, especially that sort of image, is I think when most of the comments come together, where where besides all of the well-crafted, well-made coherent overall, the interior, the shapes, the, the sort of weaving, I think all of that works well, but it all falls apart with the public realm, in my opinion, right? I think I agree that you create this very beautiful structure that weaves in, but then you start adding and adding elements with no notion of when to stop, when they don't work, and even that's a clear example that the black, surface there, it's, it's, if you take it out, it's better, right? You're making all of this effort to create this structure, and then the additional elements just mess it up, right? I think, and taking on more on the public realm, I think that's where all of these spaces here could have been much more defined, how you move through, what you create in those spaces, to then give a coherency to the overall, which I agree with Patrick, that's where the composition is very difficult to, uh, to accept, right? To so say, like, why would you want to live in this one and not on this one? And how would you know that you live in this one and not on that one, right? It would be a, a mess to find your own place. And I think that's where this goes back to the stacking of modules and it doesn't become um, an excitement composition where everything else is very exciting, so. May I? Caroline is always very kind. With Patrick, no microphone, no talk. <laughs> and there's only one mic. And there's only one mic because uh, at the AA, it comes, at, it comes at a premium, it seems. Uh, I just want to make one comment, and it goes to the binary relationship between public, private, and the section that kind of creates the stratification. I mean, a lot of the early interests and even the titling of your thesis about the oblique obviously is about the function of the oblique and the issues of Claude Perrant was kind of looking at and Virilio and so forth. And I think the thing that you guys haven't really put as much emphasis on is that uh, there was a slippage between those planes of actually what was a, a house, what was circulation. The planes actually intersected between that public-private domain and that became a new kind of territory because you're constructing a new ground in one sense, but in some sense, it's still in the kind of high line mode of strategy, which of course is a useful model to know, but at this magnitude and, and the fact that you're creating this kind of new infrastructure, I think how it connects back into the ground, all of those things to the context. I think Paul uh, Virilio and Paul
Perrant to actually offer the possibilities to see that, and then the discussions about Patrick's uh, thoughts about the orientation of the obliques. If this actually really takes the full scale of the stretch, those obliques are there because they are the circulation that are stitching together on many different levels. Because without these larger, bigger moves, I think it becomes very difficult to sort of negotiate these kind of flipping of geometry. And even though if you're doing it, I think you can, I think, push it much further because also keeping everything on a podium and then putting the housing on top is a very kind of classical kind of housing strategy. I think with Paulo's point about the public, I think you guys should speculate about what happens there. I mean, we've talked about the barbecue, we've talked about rich programming strategies that would also create a variation in the section of very different programs, exploit the kind of structural gymnastics, but then offer a possibility to actually think about this thing as a city in its own right, because this part of the city in a certain sense, over time, would have to actually start to interface. This isn't about one intervention. It's about how this starts to instrumentalize a kind of new urbanism that could potentially form around it as well. Thank you, okay. Well, well done, great project, and joined very much the, um, the presentation, and that's what made uh, the comments and also your presentation made me think a little bit. Um, something that's maybe also pertinent to the whole research question, because so you you present these three parts in some kind of seamless narrative. You've got the research, you um, have the locations, uh, social ambition, and then also finally fabrication, and it becomes. Yeah, you very smooth, uh, smoothly, fluently, you move from one whole, uh, yeah, from one of these very different actually aspects of um, the built realm into another, and then in the end, some people point out to you, well, they, it doesn't work, maybe, um, and and some and some uh, parts are essentially very different from the other. So that makes me wonder if really this ambition of um, a such a comprehensive research that moves into the, with this prototyping and robotic arms actually straight without any kind of uh, feedback loops and iterations and so on from uh, conceptualization into production is something we uh, we we really see any yeah we should aspire to um, at all maybe just a question, just a thought. Here we go. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a really positive spin on what you did today. So while, while my backup here is left, I mean, sorry, but, but Ross left and we had a really deep and meaningful conversation about your project. So what, what Ross really said was magic about your project was the fabrication technique. And his suggestion was that if you scaled up these elements, and you housed the living and the public components inside the infrastructure itself, you gain the elegance, but you have less moves. Therefore, you have here 11 systems which could be customizable. We slide those elements inside. Now, he also mentioned UK has about 15% tree cover, apparently. Uh, imagine increasing the rooftops as a kind of a public space, garden space, which in a way is like Highline. In a way, if you think about the uh, Yokohama co competition with foreign, foreign office many years ago, I mean, it creates the area on top to engage with the community. If you think about the two million square, square, uh, square two million kilometers of rail line in, in UK, it's an amazing opportunity to scale the project, to become a system which then becomes a layer of customizable environments. So that is the magic of your project. I think you you were over ambitious, which is great, but I think the over ambitious element is that you try to introduce the housing element as a separate unit. 
Whereas if you look at these, I'm gonna stand up, apologies. Uh, if you look at these elements here, and if I scale this up, you could slide these elements and create these um, amazing environment with, which was discussed before, which is the idea of the oblique. And the nature of your infrastructure is, has this incredible elegance. If you scale these up, it becomes fantastic. Then you start to think about how do you bring the people through? It's the question, for example, that Elon Musk is with the boring company, question which is, it goes the other way, which is how do we create a system that communicates back to the community? How do we bring the vehicles through? How do we create these stopping points that along the railway line which engage with so many different groups and different type of urban scales starts to communicate across the various layers and create scale. But this here is really interesting because you can see the variability that starts to connect to the various possibilities of engagement. If you start to pick this up, it starts to become a, a, a level of elegance that brings another world to an otherwise inert railway system. That's my positive spin on that. Then he comes back to these guys, and they can develop it further. <laughs> yeah, what, one final question, um, <laughs> or, or suggestion. Just so you know how to develop Exactly. No, I mean, we, there was a lot of proposals a few years ago about putting kind of cycle highways above train lines. I think you've missed an opportunity here to have a you know, have at least some space reserved to recycle superhighway. Just a final suggestion. Thank you. Thank you.